das Argument war jetzt nicht unbedingt, dass man alles ignorieren muss oder so, sondern dass man erkennt, wann man in dieser permanenten Defense ist. Und dass es sich eigentlich nicht lohnt, permanent in der Defense zu sein, weil du damit ja auch irgendwie, wenn du die ganze Zeit darauf eingehst, inhaltlich, in, äh, sozusagen auf der Oberfläche, auf, der, auf dem Datentransfer allen anderen klar machst, dass das ein Punkt ist, auf den man inhaltlich überhaupt reagieren muss. Wobei man ja quasi eigentlich also diesen Bullshit sozusagen also Kindergarten einfach weglassen kann. Ne, also deswegen sozusagen bin ich auch immer nicht drauf eingegangen, wenn Leute gesagt haben, red doch mal mit dem und dem und mach doch mal irgendwie jetzt was dazu oder so. Diese Kinderargumente sind mir halt nichts. Vor allem, weil ich die ja alle schon die Bank habe in meinen Videos. Ja, darum ging es ja wahrscheinlich eher. Wenn du in diesem Debate-Game mitspielen willst, äh, dann ist das noch eine ne ganz andere Sache. Aber dann würde ich mit einem Autoritätsargument kommen. Und dafür muss man halt irgendwie was drauf haben. Dafür muss man halt einfach mal irgendwie Ahnung haben, wovon man redet und nicht einfach nur ein scheiß Politiker sein. Das ist ja das Problem. Politiker haben ja nur gelernt, wie man, äh, wie man äh, Marketing macht. Aber sie haben ja keine Ahnung von Inhalten. Und im Marketing- und Wettbewerbsgame gewinnen natürlich die Privathacking-Strategien des Wettbewerbs. Deswegen können Linke da nicht gewinnen mit dieser Strategie. Das ist ja das Problem. So, jetzt geht's hier weiter. Es geht hier weiter. So I get a fair number of critiques, and some things ruder than critiques, saying that the alt-right playbook isn't actually about the alt-right. I talk about a tactic the alt-right uses, and someone says, that's not an alt-right thing, that's a general conservative thing. Don't say alt-right when you mean Republicans, they're not the same. It's hard to separate the good yeah. faith and bad faith versions of this argument, but for those offering the former, I'm going to take a moment to address this. I am, in fact, very careful with my language. If we want to graph American politics on the usual left-right-center spectrum, Republicans take up the bulk of conservatism, and the alt-right is way over here on the fringes. So when I say Republicans or conservatives, I'm referring to this part of the spectrum. When I say far-right or alt-right or reactionaries, I'm referring to this end. And when I say the right, I'm referring to the entire right. I even take the effort to draw them differently, this little dupe being your run-of-the-mill conservative and this little dupe being your far-right reactionary. But here's where the waters get muddy. The alt-right playbook is not a dissection of alt-right persons, but alt-right rhetoric, and the rhetoric of the alt-right is designed to proliferate beyond them as a group. It is meant to convert conservatives into reactionaries, and it is meant to make reactionaries palatable to the Republican Party. It's a mix of exploits to liberal tactics, conservative talking points co-opted and weaponized to their own purposes, and new techniques they hope will be unwittingly picked up by folks outside exactly. their sphere. Das ist das Overton Window. Genau, Babsi. No? In den, sagen wir mal, vor zehn Jahren. Remigration. No chance, ne? Ähm, was war vor zehn Jahren gerade so? Hm, Asyltourismus oder so? Oder ist das auch null? And because they are pretty effective at all of this, the techniques in the alt-right playbook are being used by a lot more than just the alt-right. The alt-right is a pretty small but disproportionately influential group. They're not the most powerful thing in modern politics, but they are, to use some esports terminology, controlling the meta. Basically, their hungry box in the first half of 2016. Not yet the most formidable opponent in the game, but if you don't have a plan for getting past hungry box, you aren't getting to grand finals. So whether or not a person is a member of the alt-right has only so much correlation with whether or not they use alt-right rhetoric. The entire political spectrum is being colored by the alt-right as their language enters common parlance and their figureheads speak at colleges. That's kind of their goal. And they're not the first to do it. Most of these techniques were workshopped in other reactionary groups in the years before the alt-right existed, which is why there's such high overlap between those groups and the alt-right. To restate what I said in the introduction, the alt-right playbook is a collection of the rhetorical strategies the alt-right uses to legitimize itself and gain power. They're not the only people who use these strategies, and a few of them are as old as dirt. I've made a point never to imply otherwise, though maybe that hasn't been coming across. 
Anyway, some final bits of wiggle room. I occasionally use some variant of this dupe or the word conservative to refer to libertarians or anti-social justice folks who are otherwise pretty politically disengaged, so it's not always shorthand for Republican. Just pay attention to which word I use. And there are a lot of people who use all the same tactics as the alt-right, support all the same policies, and vote for all the same politicians, but do not self-identify as alt-right. For my mm -hmm. purposes, I'm considering that a distinction without a difference. I also acknowledge that you can see these methods on both the right and the left, and do admit as much in every single video, but I still call them tactics of the right because the sheer quantitative use between the right no, and in den Staaten, finde ich, wird ja auch offensichtlich, dadurch, dass, dass, äh, also dadurch, dass im Prinzip die ganze Zeit das passiert, was im ersten Video die Phase war, nämlich die konservativen Rechten volllappen, schmeißen die ganze Zeit irgendwelchen Bullshit hin, geht es niemals um was Relevantes. Ne? Es wird die ganze Zeit nur Zeit verschwendet mit diesem Bullshit. In den Staaten sehen wir es ja. Auch die, die sich da links nennen, sind ja einfach nur straighte Kapitalisten. Das heißt, es wird sich nie was am System ändern. Und die Rechten brauchen nur warten, bis das System immer weiter in den Krisenmodus reingeht und dann äh, wünschen sich auf einmal alle autoritäre Lösungen und einen Führer zurück. Das ist einfach safe. Right and the left is not comparable. This is a question of degree, not of kind. I know a lot of people who criticize me do not diligently watch all the videos. I think most of them don't even get halfway through one before leaving an angry comment. So I know nothing I say here is going to stop them from making these same criticisms. But if you found this useful and you see someone saying you're con- Linnemann mit seinen Totalverweigerern, die de facto 0,000 irgendwas im Staatshaushalt äh, bedeuten, der kann in jede Talkshow eingeladen werden. Und es gibt Probleme, die irgendwie... 90% der Bevölkerung direkt was angehen und die werden nicht besprochen. Inflating alt-right and republican in the comments, you don't have to argue with them. Just link them to this video, yeah? Thanks. Ja. Du, 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 du. Say for the sake of argument, there's this acclaimed science fiction writer and essayist who is writing his memoir in the late 80s. I'm just going to drop the pretense right now and say his name is Samuel R. Delaney. He's been name dropped on this channel before and probably will be again because he's my favorite writer. So Delaney's writing about his experience as a young gay man in the late 50s, early 60s, which is to say nearly a decade before Stonewall, and he opts to share a couple of anecdotes which I will relate to you now. One is about the time when he decided to come out to his therapy group. While being gay in mid-century New York brought Delaney a lot of joy, he found himself describing his life to the group as though being gay were something he was trying to fix. By reflex, he presented himself as lonely and ashamed, though in reality, he was neither. And while he did eventually describe himself more accurately, he can't help but muse in the book on the limits of language at the time. Back then, the word gay was explicitly associated with high camp and effeminacy, where Delaney's more of a bear, a term that was not yet in common usage. The default term was homosexual, which was then a medical classification for what was deemed a mental disorder. Queer and the F word were still slurs that had yet to be reappropriated. So while all the words to describe himself were technically available, they all carried the connotations of the most popular narrative about gay men, that they were isolated, aberrant, and pitiable. Another story is about Delaney being present for a police raid at a truck stop where queer men would meet for casual hookups. By the nature of being hidden in the bushes or secreted between parked semi-trailers, any man in attendance could see the men nearest to him, but none could get a view of the whole. But during the raid, from his vantage point, Delaney saw for the first time the size of the entire crowd and was shocked to see nearly a hundred men empty out of the parking lot to evade the cops. In the morning, the police blotter mentioned only the handful of men who'd been arrested and not the 80 or 90 who got away. Mm -hmm. Both of these stories are about how the dominant narrative of the isolated gay man becomes self-reinforcing. The constant threat of police violence meant gay men stayed hidden from the cops and, consequently, from each other. And the terminology of the era being mostly dictated by straight people made it very hard to talk about queerness without reinforcing that narrative. Delaney argues that among the most revolutionary ich denke, das ist auch tatsächlich die Re das Reinforcement, was in diese kleinen Mädchen reingetan wird, damit sie auch weiterhin immer harmlos bleiben. Sie kriegen von Anfang an Kekse dafür, dass sie klein und harmlos sind. Und dann wird ihnen die Geschichte erzählt, dass alle Mädchen klein und harmlos sind. 
Und es gibt ja welche, die da ausbrechen, auch schon im Kindergartenalter und so. Aber über die gibt es keine Geschichten. Und wenn, dann sind die Geschichten so, dass man sofort erkennt, hier handelt es sich um reine Fiktion. Things the 60s did to culture was the radicalization of language, redefining old terms and popularizing new ones, and giving marginalized groups a budding sense of their numbers. In short, two of the most powerful tools for making any marginalized group less marginalized are language and visibility. Folks, we're talking today about mainstreaming, the process by which a group or idea from the fringes of society moves ja, eben, towards the center, Fiktion. how strangers become neighbors and how thoughts become common sense. There's this concept known as the Overton window, which I am not going to describe because plenty of people have done so already, link in the down there part. But in short, as a fringe group becomes more visible and their language becomes more commonplace, their presence in society starts to seem normal. They become demystified. Some people who thought they were strange and threatening will start to warm up to them, though this doesn't happen across the board. Many who hated them when they were fringe will see their becoming mainstream as a kind of existential occupation of territory, as in, if this is normal now, what does that make me? But much of what is considered standard in society today has gone through this process. Now, straight folks like myself often think that greater queer visibility and the proliferation of queer language is for our benefit. If our queer friends feel safe coming out to us and we know which words we should and shouldn't use, it makes it easier for straights and queer folks to be pals. And it is true that no one gets mainstreamed without advocates in the existing mainstream, but let's not beat around the bush. Language and visibility are tools of consolidating power. Visibility means having a sense of your numbers. Common language means forming alliances. You get a bunch of formally isolated gay men connecting with each other and accurately describing their experiences. You've got yourself a movement with or without straight friends. This is why it's to the benefit of straight society to tell queer men that they are isolated because isolated queer men are in no position to make demands. Mm -hmm. And just so it doesn't get left out of yet another conversation, Delaney is writing about gay men because the book is a memoir and that's his experience, but neither he nor I are ignoring that the gay rights movement was kicked off by trans women. Okay. While the example I'm using is a positive one that any progressive worth their salt should be in favor of, mainstreaming is a morally neutral phenomenon. Culture is plastic. Any fringe group or idea can become normalized, regardless of its inherent worth. And for a certain subset of extremely online people with fringe beliefs who understand the ways mainstreaming has evolved in the attention economy, it can be a weapon. We need to talk about how a group of predominantly disgruntled 20 and 30 something white men congregating on anonymous image boards becomes a political movement whose members get profiled in the New York Times, whose writing patterns are recognized by most of the internet, and whose figureheads get staffed in the White House. Where did the alt-right come from? Mainstreaming is not a wholly organic process, because usually the people who get mainstreamed are actively working to become so. But people usually have only so much control over how and how fast this happens. A group expands its language and visibility. If this leads to larger numbers and greater mainstream acceptance, the process repeats, this time with a bigger group and a larger audience. So long as there is growth, each cycle is more impactful. As the bigger a group is, the faster it gets even bigger, and the more common language becomes, the faster it proliferates. By all rights, if your beliefs are wildly unpopular, this process shouldn't work. Your language and visibility don't expand because too many people don't want to talk like you or about you. So what then? Well, normally you either give up or bide your time, but if you have a lot of media literacy and no real moral compass, you get it done dirty. If the media doesn't want to cover you, make yourself newsworthy. Threaten to publicly out immigrants in front of a crowd, start a hoax about white student unions, lead a white power rally and leave the hoods at home. Do the kinds of things that journalists cannot in good conscience ignore. And once you've made yourself news, they'll feel they can't publish a condemnation without getting your side of the story. So bam, you've got yourself an interview. The more erratic and dangerous you seem, the more they'll want to write a profile so people can figure you out. The article about how surprisingly normal you seem in person basically writes itself. If you want to spread a conspiracy theory, send it to a small local news site. Also diese Strategie werfe ich ja auch vielen Leuten vor, die große Reichweiten haben. Also das machen die nicht mit Absicht, sondern das ist einfach durch Zufall so entstanden. Ne? Also zum Beispiel würde ich sagen, 
Imp ist ja durch Drachen, durchs Drachengame mehr oder weniger groß geworden und auf dieser Welle mitgeschwommen, genauso wie Dekolleté. Dann, dann haben die irgendwann was anderes gemacht, ne? Aber erstmal haben sie Reichweite bekommen. Für irgendein Bullshit, ne? Das wird dann übelst oft, dass Leute Reichweite bekommen und dann die Richtung ändern, weil sie sich auf einmal äh, umentscheiden, weil sie auf einmal daraus gelernt haben oder weil es Absicht war. Spielt keine Rolle. Auf jeden Fall ist das eine Strategie. Erstmal Reichweite kriegen, egal womit, ne? that doesn't have the resources to fact check you. Once they publish something salacious, all the bigger news channels will have to talk about it if only to debunk it. Put provocative stuff in front of politicians because anything they retweet has to be news. In a pinch, you can always piggyback off a famous activist by making takedown videos or, if you're really ambitious, harass someone at a conference. Everyone is desperate for clicks. If mm -hmm. you can generate them, you'll get your message out. And if nobody's adopting your language, Adopt it for them. Make sure you and all your friends each have half a dozen fake Twitter accounts spamming the same terminology at any. Klein ist er nicht und dumm ist er auch nicht. Das ist halt beides nicht richtig. Anyone who discusses race, gender, orientation or ability. Put every Jewish name in parentheses until everyone on the internet knows what that means, whether they want to or not. Mm -hmm. Hell, don't even do it yourself. Russia is not the only one who can make bots. Make thousands of bots and make sure your real account your fake accounts and your bots all talk the same so that no one can tell the difference anymore make hashtags and get them trending all by yourself and while you're at it spam all the hashtags for movements you hate with porn and gore so they can't be used and if your words and memes still aren't popular just steal words and memes that are already popular just decide this this means white power now this is anti-feminist now Saturate the web with your new usage, always insisting that you're doing it ironically, while eroding confidence in anyone who uses these terms in the original sense. And never stop insisting that everyone would talk the same as you if there weren't so much damn censorship. Delaney's experience was having few words to describe himself. Das ist eine gute Strategie, ne? Also das ist eine gute Strategie, um diese Reichweite zu bekommen einmal. Einfach das, das machen so spielt keine Rolle. Das ist wirklich, ja. So kann man es machen, ne? Ich sag's euch. Der einzige, der true to his shit ist, äh, bin ich. Alle anderen haben sich äh, 3000 Mal gewendet in ihrer Position. Und mit alle meine ich, mein ich natürlich nicht alle. Ist eine grobe Übertreibung. Aber ihr wisst schon, was ich meine. <lacht> That could conjure images of a gay man in a loving community. What the alt-right does is shout, you just call everyone you don't like Nazi, while their people are giving interviews wearing Nazi paraphernalia. They even argue that calling dudes marching to the tune of Jews will not replace us Nazis is somehow anti-Semitic. Meanwhile, they ask to be called identitarians and race realists. They want to stigmatize words that conjure images of white fascism, which, again, they very explicitly support and replace them with words that conjure images of clean-cut philosophy majors. And where Delaney saw a group of 80 or 90 gay men reported in the papers as a group of four or five, the alt-right wants to get reported as being much larger than it actually is. They want to draw attention to themselves by any means necessary, up to and including violence, but to ensure that any time the cameras train on a violent act, there is a man in a suit ready to distance himself from it. To paint the picture that, but for a few bad actors, this is a peaceful movement of young, presentable intellectuals. This isn't simply a battle between different ideologies, this is a battle over the definition of normal. The alt-right knows how plastic culture can be. Their anger comes from the normalization of things they hate, and their movement exists because they believe anything that becomes mainstream can be made fringe again. Which is why if you want to cater to them, you promise to reassert old norms. Much as we'd like to believe that people are driven by morality, most people are driven by the desire to be normal. And when the news is filled with images of swastikas, iron crosses, and tiki torches, the guy in the suit with the fashy haircut looks pretty normal by comparison. Genau. And that's why he wears the suit. Thankfully, the plasticity of culture cuts both ways. Just as surely as we can lose all the ground we've gained over the last half century, everything the alt-right does to make itself palatable can be undone. In fact, it's maybe beginning to happen. It's going to be a long road that will probably require changes to how media platforms generate traffic and a lot of new politicians, but I want you to keep a phrase close to your heart. This is not normal. 
That phrase has become something of a mantra since the election in 2016, and it can be misused. White supremacy, sexism, and every other kind of bigotry are part of the fabric of American life, and always have been. So even if this is more extreme than the huge, it's not by nearly as much as most privileged people like to think. So I want you to treat this less like an observation, and more like a statement of intent. Whatever shit the alt-right pulls, I want you to say, this is not normal. This is not normal. This is not normal. We will not let this be normal. Stimmt, ne? Die AfD sagt ja auch sowas wie Deutschland, aber normal. Mhm, ja. Na klar. Und äh, seien wir mal ehrlich, Fremdenfeindlichkeit, Konservativismus, Angst vor äh, da draußen ist irgendwas und so, das ist aber tatsächlich schon auch normal in Deutschland. Wir haben halt wirklich dieses epigenetische Trauma, was uns äh, durch das Dritte Reich sozusagen mehrere Generationen von Stücken im Ersch, im, in den Ärschen so, äh, so hart reingeschoben hat. Das kriegt man da nur schwierig raus, dieses ganze Spießertum und dieser ganze Dreck so, dass selbst Leute, die irgendwie sagen von sich, sie sind irgendwie links, trotzdem insgeheim super autoritär sind und äh, also da ist so viel Bullshit dabei und so viel wenig Überzeugung und so wenig Idealismus, sondern eher so, ja ich weiß auch nicht. Einfach, ja, gefühlte, gefühlte Wahrheit so, dass, äh, ja, das hält man nur schwer aus. Und das ist in Deutschland, glaube ich, sehr stark. Ich, ich weiß auch nicht, also, wir haben schon wirklich den Vogel abgeschossen mit unserer Spießerkultur. Say for the sake of argument, there's this guy, Theseus. We'll get to him in a minute. People who know this story, please don't spoil the ending. Imagine you're bouncing around Twitter, a damn fool thing to do, but who am I to judge? And you come across someone claiming public figure X doxed me. You're thinking, oh no, I'm a fan of Public Figure X. I find their work very inspiring. So you look a little deeper into the story and you come to understand a few things. First, it turns out by Public Figure X, they mean an employee of Public Figure X. Well, employees are often acting on behalf of their employers. If your campaign staff meets with Russians, it's reasonable to say that you are in contact with Russia. So maybe this is something like that. Also, it turns out that by employee, they mean a contractor that Public Figure X hired several years ago. Well, okay, if a contractor does something on behalf of a client, that's basically the same as an employee doing it. And apparently by doxed, they don't mean Public Figure X or Public Figure X's contractor personally hacked anyone's computer. They mean Public Figure X's people shared information that had been acquired by someone else. Well, that's fair. If someone posts your home address on a forum and then the forum spreads it all over the internet, it's reasonable to say the forum doxed you. Oh, but it wasn't a home address or a private email, it was the person's name. Well, if you're anonymous for safety reasons, having your name revealed can lead to threats or silencing, so depending on why you're anonymous, having your name leaked can be a kind of doxing. Oh, and by leaked my name, they mean liked a tweet that had the name in it. Hmm. Okay, now say you're bumming around Facebook, which maybe you shouldn't, but I do it too, and someone posts an article saying, all pornography is coercive. You're thinking, wow, that's a pretty sweeping statement. I gotta investigate this. So you read the article, and it seems mm -hmm. there's a school of thought that since in porn the product is usually images of women's bodies, women tend to be socially pressured or financially incentivized to do things with their bodies that people like to see but they aren't necessarily comfortable with. Since that consent is not freely given, all pornography is coercive. And you think, well, what about worker-owned porn collectives or amateur porn that's just exhibitionists who don't monetize their videos? And after digging around the author's work, you find buried in a footnote in another article that, in their opinion, if it's worker-owned or unmonetized, it isn't porn, it's erotica. Okay. Now say you've ambled into the wild lands of Tumblr, woe betide the ones who travel too far from their dashboards, and you come across the claim that Activist Y is a bigot. You're thinking, ah, geez, first public figure X and now this? So you read a number of other posts on the subject and eventually piece together that, by bigot, the people making this claim mean anti-sex worker, which, no question, that is a bigotry. And by anti-sex worker, they mean anti-sex, which, okay, that's kind of a stretch. And by anti-sex, they mean prudish, which is definitely a stretch, and by prudish they mean is critical of the sexual objectification of women in fantasy imagery because they believe it drives women away from the community. 
Let's bring back our buddy Theseus. So Theseus, or more specifically his boat, is the subject of a famous thought experiment, the ship of Theseus. It goes like this. If you were in possession of the ship of Theseus, and one day you were to replace a single board with a fresh one, and the next day you replaced another, and the next day another, and the next day another, one by one until not a single stick of the original remained, would it still be the same boat? Mm. If so, what is the essence of boatness that remains yeah. even... Also, das ist natürlich schon immer so ein Ding gewesen, ne? Das habe ich auch nicht gecheckt, bevor mir das mit der Emergenz nicht klar war, ne? Ein Boot ist natürlich ein emergentes Objekt aus diesen Holzplanken. Ne? Ein Boot zeichnet ja aus, dass diese ganzen Holzplanken in einer ganz bestimmten Form ange äh, angeordnet sind. Und deren Wechselwirkung erzeugt das Boot. Ne? And when all the materials have changed. If not, when did it become a different boat? When the last board was replaced? When half were replaced? Three quarters? Now don't worry, it's first. a thought experiment. There's no right answer, just a lot of philosophy. But the corollary I'm making here is, what happens when you ship of Theseus a statement? These are arguments where words and bits of rhetoric have been replaced piece by piece until very little of the original sentence remains. How many words can you change in an argument until it's not the same argument anymore? There are a few different aims when somebody does this. One is making the unacceptable acceptable. The statement, activist Y is against sexual objectification, is not controversial among progressives. If you go after activist Y for that belief, you're going to make progressive enemies. But if you redefine this as anti-sex and anti-sex as bigot, now it's activist Y who has the enemies and you've just smuggled an anti-feminist argument into feminist language. Two is making the unremarkable remarkable. Some pornography is coercive is not the kind of take that sells magazine subscriptions. But if you've got a private definition of pornography that excludes sexually explicit material that isn't coercive, mm -hmm. well, that's a provocative headline. Especially since, at first glance, nobody knows you're using a non-standard definition of the word. Yep. Now, it is true that at its... Das mache ich ja auch manchmal, ne? Weil ich mir einfach neue Worte definiere oder alt, alte Worte, die anders benutzt wurden, schwurbelig definiert würden, irgendwo nochmal sauber für mich selber definiere und dann eine ganz präzise äh, Definition habe, äh, wo ich dann aber so äh, provokative Statements raushauen kann dadurch. Ne? Worst of the porn industry is a misogynist hellscape also zum Beispiel sowas wie Werbung ist Gewalt. <lacht> ne? das, das kann ich ja dann machen mit meiner Definition von Gewalt. Regulated capitalism, but there are a lot of people ready to blame that on this bit rather than this bit and this bit, and are hungry for articles that tell them being anti-porn. Oder Politik ist Marketing, wo andere sagen würden, Politik ist das, was äh, ist das Aushandeln äh, des, äh, der Entscheidungen, die der Staat und das Gewaltmonopol, also demzufolge das Gewaltmonopol treffen. Ne? Also das würden manche mit Politik gleichsetzen. Und für mich ist eigentlich der ganze Vorderbau eher das, was Politik ausmacht. Politik bedeutet für mich, dahin zu kommen, den Wettbewerb sozusagen zur Entscheidungsfindung. Das, das zeichne ich mit Politik aus. Porn is progressive rather than anti-woman and anti-worker. Any acknowledgement that ethical porn exists would make that perception fail, so, of course, it's transmuted out of the conversation. Three is cutting people off from their communities. The statement, someone who used to work with Public Figure X liked a tweet that had my name in it, gets converted into Public Figure X doxed me for the purpose of turning Public Figure X's community against them, with the added benefit of gaining favor with anyone who already hates them. It's a standard abusive boyfriend tactic. If you want to mistreat someone, first you cut them off from their friends. In the case of someone who is embraced by the progressive community, you slander them using something that community cares about. A lot of progressives are acclimated to getting burned, to finding out the gay activist harasses his employees, that the race activist exploits the labor of women, and that puts a lot of people on edge, Hello, and frankly, it's warranted. But when folks feel like they're just waiting to be betrayed again, they can be a little too willing to believe horror stories about their allies. I wouldn't say this is chronic, but it does happen, more than a little, and people will take advantage of it. The rhetorical ship of Theseus is a devilish maneuver because it relies on the kinds of substitutions that are, in a vacuum, defensible. Yes, 
A person who spreads private information is just as much a doxer as the person who acquired it. Yes, a person who is anti-sex worker is typically operating in a sex-negative attitude. Many of these substitutions will work in context, but the ship of Theseus is about making an inordinate number of substitutions and then burying the context. One can make the already dubious argument that this isn't technically a lie, but it's meant to form a picture in your mind of something that didn't happen happen. Public Figure X personally releasing private information as an act of directed harassment. The necessary context that describes what actually happened is only provided when the statement is challenged, usually in the form of lawyerly hair splitting. We can cite precedent that in the case of Twitter Personality Q versus NeoGAF, the leaking of Twitter Personality Q's name was considered doxing, so it stands to reason. This gets you mired in the truthfulness of individual claims, debating technicalities of a statement blatantly meant to deceive. You're never given a chance to articulate the original statement before its transformation. Its final form just sits there, pristine and shareable, at the top of your enormous Twitter argument. And we've already discussed the power of statements that are short, quippy, and wrong. More than most things I've covered in this series, these are tactics I've seen across the entire political spectrum, most especially number three. Liberal, conservative, progressive, reactionary. This is a thing bad people do, even on the left. Someone with good politics isn't necessarily a good person who won't use the rhetoric of social justice to rationalize shitty behavior. The rhetoric is specifically designed to combat this, but it's not airtight, and there's nothing so special about progressivism that makes us immune to abusers and opportunists. The main difference is that when the right does this, it does it to the left, and when the left does this, it does it to itself. The far right is perfectly happy converting an attack or a bad argument into whatever they think progressive language sounds like, and bigots on the left are perfectly happy sneaking transphobic arguments into feminism, but the left by and large will not touch conservative language. We don't try to isolate a member of the alt-right by telling his community he's a race traitor or secretly gay. We don't often smuggle environmental messages into militaristic language, though some people who are not me think we should. The closest we come is when we run centrist candidates who present themselves as the best of the right and the left, but the right doesn't buy it. Even when we call someone on the right racist, homophobe, anti-Semite, which the right will claim is a ship of Theseus, it doesn't serve the same purpose. People can disagree with me on whether the left is disingenuous when it talks like this, but they can't argue this is hurting the right. I mean, when's the last time a Republican lost a job for being too homophobic? They're more likely to lose no. the job for being queer. And we can call Republicans racist until the castle rises above the clouds, but their constituency is made up of people who either cannot be convinced that one of their own is a racist, or can, but don't care. Or they prefer it that yeah, way. Or even the school Discussing does, bigotry know. on the right is mostly so the left knows what it's up against. There's no real solution to the ship of Theseus other than to memorize what the dummy words are. To know when a turf says child abuse. Ja, diese Idee von wegen Klimaschützen ist gleich lebenswichtige Ressourcen äh, verteidigen. Das ist, das ist ja komplett, das Argument ist ja sozusagen in der Identität der Konservativen schon komplett zersplittert. Denn wenn du dir vorstellst, dass Konservative tatsächlich konservativ wären, dann müssten sie ja an Naturschutz interessiert sein. Der Trick ist ja, dass die Konservativen überhaupt nicht konservativ sind. Wenn sie überhaupt irgendwas äh, konservieren wollen, dann sind es Machtverhältnisse. Das ist was Abstraktes. Und wenn sie, wenn, wenn sie labern, dann wollen sie immer zurück zu einer Fiktion, die es nie gab. Das ist, also das ist einfach Schwachsinn. Deswegen ist es super scheiße, dass das so, äh, dass die überhaupt Konservative sich nennen. Aber das ist, das ist wie immer. Rechte fangen immer an, erstmal sich die Worte zu sichern. Abuse, they mean calling trans kids by the correct pronouns. When a swerf says rape, they mean consensual sex work. I can't give you a comprehensive list because I don't know all the words that would be on it and it would be outdated as soon as I gave it to you. But with practice, you can get a sense of when an argument sounds fishy and which people tend to give fishy arguments. Usually with a bit of googling you can find all the buried context has already been dug up by someone. People tend to be pretty quick about this.
Learning to spot the ship of Theseus when you come across it is useful not just so you don't repeat hearsay you haven't verified, but because it tells you something about the person using it. The ship of Theseus is a kind of elaborate euphemism. What language they use reveals what they think we care about. What language they won't use reveals what they can and can't say. It's a temperature check for where we are as a society. What things do horrible people feel they can get away with, and what things do they have to disguise? But no disguise is perfect, and if you do the fact-checking, it will show you where they're weak. People will try to contort the truth, but the truth leaves an essence behind. Ja, hast recht. Also an sich würde ich sagen, äh, schwieriges Video im Vergleich zu den anderen, ne? Aber ja. Say, for the sake of argument, you're a liberal journalist in the year 2016 of the Common Era. Your beat is covering the Republican primaries. A lot of people are vying for the presidential nomination, and so it falls to you to attend and write up their debates. Part of your job is deciphering conservative euphemisms. When the subject of illegal immigration comes up, for instance, you'll have to explain to your audience that the idea of protecting America... Ja, eigentlich ging es um... Äh, eigentlich würde ich sagen, ging es darum, wie die rechten äh, Clickbait-Headlines äh, Head machen. Die dann, äh, also das ist ja oft so, du klickst auf einen Clickbait drauf und denkst dir, das kann ja wohl nicht sein. Und dann stellst du fest, es stimmt auch gar nicht, was in der, in der Schlagzeile steht. Das ist oft so. Und das liegt daran, dass die Worte, die da verwendet werden, dann im Artikel relativiert werden. Na? Und äh, ja, das ist eine, eine normale Marketingstrategie einfach. Aber das ist ja eh so, dass sozusagen, wenn du jetzt sagst, das sind typisch rechte Strategien, die hier sozusagen etabliert sind, oder äh, dargestellt werden. Typisch rechts bedeutet für mich ja typisch Wettbewerb. Also das ist für mich das Gleiche. Deswegen ist das für mich keine Überraschung. American jobs from undocumented workers is Republican double talk for hating Mexicans. No one is tightening security at the US-Canada border. No one is pulling over white Europeans to check their visas. And undocumented workers contribute a massive amount to the economy while taxpayers don't have to cover social security, unemployment, or Medicare for them. Protecting jobs has always been used to paper over racism. So you're sitting there watching the debate, these factoids at the ready, when one of the candidates says he wants to tighten the borders because Mexico is sending us rapists and thieves. I'm sorry, what? What just happened? That is not a thing Republicans are supposed to say out loud. It's against the rules. You can't just cop to believing Mexicans are degenerates after decades of calling border security a jobs issue. Also, immigrants, legal or otherwise, aren't soldiers since when are they sent by anyone? <laughs> By the time you pull yourself out of that thought spiral, the debate has shifted. Now they're talking about the war on terror, so you somewhat warily prepare to contextualize another set of euphemisms. This is a subject almost always used to mask Islamophobia. Whenever an act of domestic terror is committed by someone of Palestinian descent, politicians try to link it to ISIS or Al-Qaeda, where if the bomber or shooter is a white Christian, the terrorist is referred to as a lone wolf, not part of any pattern, despite there being significantly more white Christian lone wolves than Palestinian terrorists. This <laughs> war on terror never seems to expand beyond regions with oil deposits. But then that same candidate... Ja, selbes gilt für irgendwelche Nazi-Gewaltverbrechen, ne? pipes up and says if elected for the sake of security he wants to create a Muslim registry and what the hell is going on? Politicians just don't talk like this. Conventional wisdom is that this kind of language will flare up the extremists in your party while alienating your base. And appealing to both at the same time is why we invented euphemisms. And sure enough, in the following months, you have far-right pundits talking about a Muslim ban on national television, waxing nostalgic about the Japanese internment camps of the 1940s like they weren't a national disgrace. You've got that same candidate casting aspersions on the judge investigating him for fraud because the judge is Mexican-American. You're sitting there with your pen ready to write an article about the alienation of the moderate Republican base, but that moment never seems to come. The guy seemingly tanking his candidacy by appealing to extremists is the one who finally secures the nomination. 
you realize with some shock that in each of these cases you are witnessing the death of a euphemism. The death of a euphemism is a rare celestial event. Politicians only let a euphemism die when they don't need it anymore. This does not imply good things for Mexicans or Muslims. The circumstances under which a euphemism may die are often spelled out in the circumstances under which it is born. So if we want to discuss it, we'll have to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about euphemistic racism in the Republican Party. In the year 1964, there was a man. We'll call him Barry, uh, Silver Milk. Silver Milk was the Republican nominee for president, and for various reasons, he was almost certainly going to lose the election. The Democrats were the incumbent party, they'd pretty much controlled Congress since the 40s, and the country was still in mourning after the devastating assassination of a Democratic president. The United States wasn't looking to change parties. About the only thing Silver Milk had going for him was that the Democrats had just signed into law the Civil Rights Act, expanding the voting rights of black citizens and desegregating a lot of American life and a lot of white voters were pissed about it. In those days, you couldn't really claim Republicans or Democrats were good on race, and black people, when they were allowed to vote at all, were much more evenly split between parties than they are today. However, a Democrat pushing through the Civil Rights Act had, intentionally or otherwise, made race a partisan issue. The upshot, Silver Milk realized, was that disgruntled white people might be willing to abandon the Democratic Party if given the right incentive. In 64, Republicans didn't have much of a coalition, not since Democratic tax policies had dragged America out of the Great Depression, and incidentally created the greatest period of economic growth and prosperity in the history of the industrialized world, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. If silver yeah, milk could natürlich. siphon white voters... Geld investieren vom Staat, uh, das ist nur Zufall, dass das was bringt out of the Democratic Party, he might bring a strength to Republicans that they hadn't seen in decades. But to do that, he'd have to run his campaign on a pro-segregation platform. Now, white racists have a complicated relationship to their own racism. They seemingly want the impossible. They want segregation without appearing to be segregationists, racist policy without the social repercussions. Possibly they don't even want to admit their racism to themselves. So Silver Milk would need a framing that allowed the blithely racist, the overtly racist, and the non-racist to unite under a single banner. For this purpose, Silver Milk landed on the long-enduring euphemism, states rights. Now, obviously, the states' rights argument didn't originate in 1964. It's very old and, in fact, used to be more of a Democrat thing. We're talking about the specific invocation of states' rights as a defense of inequality. Silvermilk argued that desegregation, though certainly a nice idea, shouldn't be enacted at the federal level because no matter how acute the plight of black Americans, the decision to desegregate should be left to the states. Of course, anyone embracing this rhetoric knew full well that many states would never in this lifetime desegregate unless forced to. Mm -hmm. But you see, that's not the aim, merely the side effect. In this framing, no one is officially pro-segregation, they're simply anti-desegregation. <laughs> this brokered a yeah. compromise between the reactionaries and the centrists in the United States. It allowed moderate Republicans some deniability about what direction their party was headed, and it allowed the Silver Milk campaign to secure the votes of white racists without having to publicly embrace them. Now, in spite of all of this, Silver Milk, as predicted, lost the election in a landslide. But it would be wrong to take that as a rejection of what he tried. This was the beginning of the modern Republican Party. This is where the Deep South, formerly a lock for the Democrats, first voted for the party of Lincoln. This is where white flight from the Democratic Party began, and why today we see white people, particularly white men, are the only demographic that consistently votes Republican. Silver Milk's rhetoric was foundational to bringing Republicans back to power in the 80s, finally breaking the Democratic hold over the House of Representatives. Some will argue that Silver Milk did sincerely believe in states' rights and that rebuilding the Republican Party by appealing to white racists was not his intent. And if you believe that, perhaps I can interest you in a very promising real estate venture in Florida. But regardless of what you believe about his intentions, that is how states' rights has been used, as a cudgel in service of bigotry. States' rights was invoked, and is still invoked, to defend anti-miscegenation laws, anti-abortion laws, same-sex marriage bans, trans bathroom bills, spousal rape, you name it. 
Every time there are gains for yep. social minorities, the Republicans shore up the votes of bigots who find these gains offensive. It's hard for the left to argue with the states' rights argument because it's not designed to make sense. Republicans will say we should leave an issue like same-sex marriage up to the states, but only after a federal ban on same-sex marriage proves infeasible. Up until that moment, they are in favor of government overreach. So states' rights has never been a consistent philosophy. But then why should it be? It's a euphemism. Its sole purpose is bringing an extreme ideology into mainstream politics. About the only blessing of a political euphemism is that the belief that can't be spoken is a belief that is, to some extent, contained. The state's rights argument makes bigotry more pervasive, but keeps it somewhat less draconian than the bigots might prefer. If you have to smuggle your marriage ban into a state's rights argument, you're painted into a corner should your state choose to legalize it. Then, if you want to keep the homophobic vote secure, you've got to find and popularize a different euphemism. Managing an alliance between moderates and reactionaries, especially when you can't acknowledge that one half of that alliance even exists, is a hard needle to thread, and depending on who's in charge of the party at a given time, the alliance can be tenuous. The far right is often well, viewed by their own party as the mad woman in the attic. We feed her, but we don't talk about her. Republican campaigners are somewhat known for going out and getting far-right folks registered to vote and then talking shit about them when they're out of earshot. I suspect they enjoy standing next to extremists because it makes them look moderate by comparison. Though we should be clear, if you need to stand next to someone whose bumper sticker says, if I had known this I would have picked my own cotton to not look racist, your house is not in order. And the far-right <laughs> knows this. Say what you want about them. They're not all fools. Their party often doesn't respect them because it doesn't have to. Who the hell else are they going to vote for? They are the necessary evil. But if what a person wants, what they actually want, is segregation, is a nationwide ban on same-sex marriage, is the mass deportation of Mexicans, is the closing of borders to all Muslim nations, this euphemistic states' rights, job security, mm -hmm. war on terror, half-measure bullshit isn't going to cut it forever. When you court the vote of bigots, sooner or later, it's put up or shut up. I don't say this to generate sympathy for them. None of these are desires worth having, and no nation calling itself a democracy should ever represent them, not even as watered-down euphemisms. But to bring us back to the recent past, I say this because in 2016, it had been a long time since these people felt that any party had truly represented them. And this is why a candidate who doesn't say protecting jobs, he says Mexicans are rapists, who doesn't say war on terror, he says Muslim registry, appeals to them. He says, in so many words, the Islamophobes, the racists, the sexists, the segregationists, they are my base. I will not appeal to moderates and treat them as the necessary evil. I will speak to them directly, without euphemism. Because, honestly, I don't know how euphemisms work. These are my people, and they mm -hmm. are the ones the Republican Party should embrace with open arms. This is supposed to be political suicide. And in the months that follow, it looks like maybe it will be. All the other journalists are writing this up as a fluke and an embarrassment. Him securing the nomination has doomed the Republican Party. The moderates will never elect him. Not only will he fail, he will lay bare the ugly truth about his entire party. He lags in the polls. Republican lawmakers disavow him. The Republican National Committee revokes their endorsement. Statisticians say not only will he lose in the swing states, but some Republican strongholds might vote Democrat for the first time in 40 years. They suspect he could drag Republicans in the House and Senate down with him. Democratic control of all three branches of government. His loss will be as sweeping as silver milks in 64, and the ensuing Republican realignment will be as dramatic. But when the day comes, that's not the headline you have to write. <laughs> How do you make sense of this? You're a political writer. You're supposed to tell people what this means. How do you even begin? Well, it means party loyalty is one of the strongest things in politics today. Come election day, people who disavowed him were making phone calls on his behalf. 
It means the Republican Party has drifted to the right far enough that the so-called moderates are more closely aligned with white nationalists than they are to the moderate left. It means, in all likelihood, the bigots are the base now, and the moderates the hangers-on. Politicians can be as racist as they want, because who the hell else are Republicans going to vote for? That's not the realignment you were expecting. Now, there's no saying how long this state of affairs will last. One election doesn't mean the center-right and the far-right know how to build a coalition. Maybe a year or two from now, when this guy has passed a little legislation, the moderates will have buyer's remorse, the extremists will feel their guy was more blunt talk than he was action, everything will be worse, and no one will be happy. But that's not much comfort, because it tells you almost nothing about how the next election will go. At this point, anything could happen. A euphemism dies when it no longer... Ja, auch zum Beispiel, dass bis dahin der Präsident ähm, einen Gottmodus bekommt, in dem er nicht mehr aufzuhalten ist und einfach ähm, politische Kandidaten umbringen lassen kann, seine eigene Frau töten lassen kann vom Geheimdienst und dass das komplett legal ist. So was könnte passieren. Longer works to disguise things that can't be said, or when culture at large decides things that can't be said are now sayable. In the last couple of videos, we've talked about how the far right mainstreams a, for instance, racist idea by convincing people it's not racist. What we're seeing here is the end game of that process. Once the public embraces them as people, elects their politicians, and implements their policies, they begin, bit by bit, to drop the pretense. Because if they want to close the borders once and for all, it's in their best interest to stop pretending border control is about protecting jobs. A sad truth about mm -hmm. humans is they will often accept almost any justification to keep doing whatever they're already doing. If someone has spent years favoring border security, they've voted for it, their taxes have paid for it, maybe they've even called ICE on someone? And one day you tell them, keep doing what you're doing, but by the way, it's not about jobs anymore, now it's about keeping Mexicans out. Okay. A lot of them will roll with it. We like to think action follows belief, and sometimes it does, but at least as often it's the reverse. And that's a dangerous thing when given the choice to do something different or do the same thing only more. To the far right, a euphemism is like a calf. Something to be brought into this world or inherited, removed from its original context, raised to adolescence, and then slaughtered when the time is right. Historically, the first sign that things are about to get a lot worse for minorities is when the racism stops being euphemistic. In a sense, the far right and the liberal journalist share a purpose. The journalist's goal is to expose the truth. Yeah, and that's haben wir auf jeden Fall in Deutschland auch, ne? Also unser Rassismus ist öffentlich. Behind the euphemism in the hopes that people will abandon bigotry once it's been made explicit. The far right does the same, hoping they won't.